Hello, friends, and welcome to the April 13th edition of Weekly Witness, Texas Impact's weekly opportunity for mainstream Texans of faith to learn about public policy issues here in the great state of Texas and talk about how you can engage in the process. My name is Scott Atnip, your host and Texas Impact's Outreach Director, and today's episode is being brought to you by Methodist Healthcare Ministries of South Texas. And I just want to start out for just a moment to recognize the world that our congregations are living in. Our Jewish and Christian listeners just celebrated Passover, Holy Week, and Easter, and our Muslim listeners are preparing for Ramadan starting on April 23rd. Uh, so faith leaders of all faiths are struggling with figuring out how to prepare meaningful worship experiences while also responding to needs the likes of which we have never experienced. And in the midst of that, our elected officials are trying to figure out what in the world to do. And they need us, they need communities of faith and faith leaders talking to them about what we are experiencing in our local communities and how we recommend uh, that they best meet the needs of our local communities. So at this moment, uh, we really need uh, you, we need the faith community to step up. Uh, Texas Impact is posting action alerts on the coronavirus page on our website, texasimpact.org. Uh, Three of those action alerts went out in our e-news last week. Uh, so it's a perfect time for you to sign up to be a part of our rapid response team if you want more in-depth action alerts or our legislative engagement groups. You can sign up for both of those opportunities on our website at texasimpact.org or you can email me directly at scott at texasimpact.org. And we look for your feedback on Weekly Witness uh, in terms of what content would be beneficial to you and your congregation. Uh, we're trying our best to bring you content on how your congregation uh, can meet these uh, these atypical needs in our local communities and how you can engage in the process. Uh, so please, please let us know how we can resource you to do that. And one of the speakers that we're excited to bring to you for today's episode is uh, Tr Trinidad Aristia, Program Director for Migration Policy with the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America. So uh, Trini, Trini, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me, Scott. And this is different. I wish we could be sitting in a room together, but uh, <laughs> if the sound is not the quality we usually have, it's because we are both zooming in from our own homes and uh, hopefully we won't have children walk in while we're doing this. Uh, so thanks for taking the time again. Um, so we just hosted a special series, uh, we being Texas Impact for Weekly Witness, uh, hosted a special uh, Weekly Witness series on health equity called Reimagining Justice. Uh, so our listeners are used to thinking about the idea of equity. And you focus on issues related to migration. So could you start out by talking about how this COVID-19 health crisis has uh, emphasized even more the disparities in our immigration system? Uh, that's a really good question, Scott. And thank you for bringing this up. Um, like COVID-19 uh, is like an unprecedented global pandemic that is knowing no borders. And this has brought into sharp focus the intersection of the U.S. immigration and public health policy and the unique challenges that um, immigrants are facing in the United States today and they're also facing outside of our borders. Um, uh, previously, the, like prior to the outbreak, uh, the Trump administration, we all know that they have been introducing some of the most stringent immigration restri uh, restrictions in modern times, as we know, by targeting um, uh, the public charge rule, the threats to the Defer Action uh, for Childhood Arrivals Program, also known as DACA, the raids by the Immigration and Customs Enforcement, the asylum restrictions, and the separation of families at the border. Um, so for, you know, right now, uh, we're not really, um, this ha this health crisis has like really, uh, really sharpened all of this, uh, issues that we have been battling against, uh, you know, since this administration even started. So for obvious reasons, uh, communities of faith, people are paying special attention to Congress because it's mm -hmm. impacting our lives more than, more than we usually recognize right now. And folks are especially interested in, in both stopping the spread of the coronavirus, but also helping protect our communities and the economy. So it might be strange to some uh, that we would focus a weekly witness episode on immigration issues right now in the midst of all that. 
But besides our faith calling us to care for our migrant brothers and sisters, why might the broader community care that immigrants, refugees, and asylum seekers be protected in this fourth stimulus bill that Congress is considering? Um, so I'm going to give you one example, uh, Portugal. Uh, Portugal actually decided to have all of their immigrants, uh, refugee, asylum seekers, undocumented immigrants, and they decided to treat them as citizens during this crisis. And why is that? It's because like, a virus <laughs> doesn't discriminate if you are have if you're documented, if you're uh, if you're an immigrant, if you are like. Um, uh, uh, born in the U.S. or born in, you know, Mexico, born in Chile, like it just it doesn't discriminate. So it's like from a public health perspective and from a policy perspective, it's extreme. It's like really smart for you to treat everybody equally, just because like it's it helps like spread the virus. So right now, you know, we're at quarters at the fourth. Um, care act and we're not seeing like immigrants being included in the bill and not just like immigrants you know we have farm workers who were like who were uh determined to be essential workers during this pandemic but right now you know the news like reported that like the administration was planning to cut their salaries to actually provide um that money for uh for the ag business so it's just it, it kind of blows your mind in that in that sense. So regardless of that, it's like that's why we we have to protect everybody. And you know, migrants like here in this country contribute enormously to our to our work. And we're not only talking about those who are working in like like low paid like jobs that you know that usually go into your mind when you think of migrants. Doctors right now, doctors or nurses are mostly uh, foreign born and they have been working here and also some doctors are also DACA recipients so what happened if like you know if all of a sudden we just don't have them anymore we're gonna have like a serious like shortage of like people who are working that they're actually contributing to this society right now not only economically but also like towards like our like public health benefit so um that's why I think it's really important and for people like, you know, of, of secular backgrounds or that they're not, um, you know, that they don't profess like a face. It's, like, it's really important for you to just like see it from like this kind of perspective. First, I would say from like a human rights, like more like a universalist because it's the right thing to do. And then from like a public policy perspective, uh, like the public health side is you need to stop the spread of the virus and viruses do not discriminate wealth, uh, ethnic background, uh, uh, country of origin, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I, I just don't understand the argument, right? Like uh, faith, faith arguments aside and kind of ethical arguments aside, uh, we should all want everybody who's in the grocery store with us to have access to testing, right? Like, uh, anyway, yeah. uh, so, <laughs> so what, so we have, We've talked a lot, there's a lot of news coverage about the, the fourth CARES Act, the fourth stimulus bill that's going to be coming forward. A lot of our listeners are going to be paying attention to that and contacting uh, their representatives about it. Uh, there are three different groups that I want to cover with you and, mm -hmm. and just hear a little bit from you about what you hope will happen for these communities. So let's start with uh, asylum seekers. Uh, what are you looking for in the fourth stimulus bill? For, that. Uh, for asylum seekers, well, uh, <laughs> so right now the asylum seekers who are actually waiting um, outside of the United States at the tents and camps in Mexico, and like most of them are actually, some of them are in Matamoros, they're, they're waiting for their cases in the most extremely like precarious conditions. If those conditions were precarious before, imagine like the conditions right now. Like those camps are like overcrowded, they lack like sanitation. So it's, it's, you're like, wait, they're like kind of like time bombs, like waiting to just say burst. And so on that end, I would like the U.S. to just treat all of those who are, um, have applied for their asylum seeking. They're waiting for the response just to give them like a fast treatment and process regarding that and bring them into the U.S., had their cases been waited, most of those who are waiting for their asylum seeking, they have 
they have families, they have relatives, they have friends here in the U.S. that they could actually stay with. And that's a much safer space for them to be waiting than be waiting at a camp. So that's something that I expect into in, in the fourth policy. Then for your refugees, uh, I mean, it, it's, it's the same. It's the distinction between like asylum seekers and refugees in, in the country are, are minimum. And what, we're wait, and what we're doing right now with those who are like seeking a refugee by sending them back through the remaining Mexico policy or the uh, bilateral agreements with Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras, we're sending them also to dangerous conditions that they were escaping from. And not only like that dangerous conditions of, uh, you know, of death, of, you know, in the case of, of women and children of uh, uh, violence, uh, but we're also sending them to countries that they do not have, like, good health to like receive them and welcome them and we have been deporting people who have also got into the country like there were like three cases in guatemala that they have arrived and that they have been deported to the u.s after the u.s said that they were going to stop deportations and they arrived into guatemala with with coronavirus so in that case it's like the u.s is i believe like morally is breaking that the definition that you thought of the U.S. like before, it's like defender of human rights. You're sending these people um, like sick, and it's it's that's just like it's not it's not correct. Uh, any other immigrant populations that that we need to be thinking about? Um, and then yeah, time? and and then for well, so we all know. So I I want you to think about. Um, you know, coronavirus is going to have like a huge impact, not just like in, you know, asylum seekers here in the U.S., refugees here in the U.S., and immigrants here in the U.S. It's going to have an impact on, on globally to all of those who are like throughout the world, like seeking, you know, shelter, like a safe space to live or also to thrive economically for the well-being of their families so they could flourish. Um, for immigrants, I hope that... Um, I hope that first, like farm workers receive, uh, they are included, that they receive like the benefits that they could uh, be part of. Same thing as daycare workers. I think that they're like a huge contribution. Everybody should be not afraid to get tested. I know that the administration said that they were not going to be pursuing deportations. But if you have been, if like that community has been hearing throughout years that they're going to be deported because of their lack of documentation. They are in fear right now. So they're not going to believe that, you know, that going to a medical facility that is not going to imply that they're going to get deported. So it's really important. First, like I would say, like the Congress actually commits to provide like a commitment that they would not get like deported, that like literally says that. And then everybody has to have access to testing and medical care if they get sick. And then you could go into the weeds because it's like, you know, for farms workers, you would also like for them to, if they get sick, then they should also have like an agreement with their employer that they're not going to lose their job since they're temporary workers. So you have like a lot of things. If you start going into the details, like it's, it's larger than, than just like, you know, the big picture is a like one thing, but then if you go into the weeds, there's so many details that they're so important for them to just be safe and, you know, and feel protected. And you detail, I know, I know uh, I get comments all the time that it's, it's hard when we start giving a laundry list of, of, <laughs> of things on a podcast. Uh, but you have a lot of these recommendations in writing with the faith leader sign-on letter. Mm -hmm. uh, I do, all yeah. Uh, so where can we find that? And is it too late for faith leaders to sign on? No, it's actually not too late to sign it. There's one uh, letter. So uh, the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America, the ELCA, works in coordination with other faith-based organizations. And we uh, we drafted together um, two different statements and two different letters, one for faith leaders and other ones for organizations. And the deadlines are actually um, on today's, like next week, Monday or Tuesday. So it's not too late for, for all of you to sign up and to, and to show your support on this. But I also, 
uh, encouraged you to not just like sign on that letter, but like be a voice and like reach out to your congressman, reach out to your representative and tell them that you are standing in favor of like immigrants. And I also forgot to mention, we have immigrants like standing in like detention centers. You know, we have families who have been separated. We have children. Children in the U.S. have died because of uh, immigrant children have died in, under the, the care of the U.S. because they lack care of when they got sick with the flu. So imagine what we're, what we're even thinking of with coronavirus. It's like, is that what we want to see? And sadly, these are kind of the cases that could go like under like the rug because like, you know, this administration has been doing like a really good job at keeping uh, immigrants and asylum seekers and refugees like under the radar on, on, on this uh, during like COVID. So we'll make sure that we share those sign-on letters uh, on text impact social media this week so folks can can find mm -hmm. them um, easily uh, but so I could share if you want the link yeah say it again no I could share you like I don't know if it is easy for you if I um, if I just like I think the, the the web address might be too long for me to share it yeah. um, so I'll just I'll, I'll, I'll email you I'll send it to you so then you could share it uh, through your social media platforms absolutely so we'll make sure we get that out there uh, say more about those telephone calls to Congress because we're certainly encouraging people to call on a number um, of issues but what's your what's your 30 second uh, pitch to, to the staffer who picks up the phone what what just we're standing with our migrant brothers and sisters or uh, What's your short, short spiel for them? So I think that the first like important thing is to recognize the work that they have been doing. And you know you have to be grateful for the measures that Congress had taken to address the crisis so far. But you also have to remind them that there, are, that there remain unique challenges that refugees and immigrants are facing. And then the crisis actually tests who we are as a nation. And we're stronger when we're united and extended compassion to our neighbors, listen to public health experts and resist medical prejudice. Uh, it is that's why it is imperative that members of Congress hear um, what, what us like, as their constituents uh, wanna see meaningful solutions to support all of our neighbors, including the immigrant and refugee community members. Um, and I think it's important for you to remind there that this is a public health, like that, you know, even, I mean, like I said at the beginning, uh, viruses do not discriminate and, you know, and immigrants do, are, are like part of like our social fabric as a nation. And I'll add just as a challenge to our folks, uh, we talked at, at the United Methodist Women's Legislative Event and at the, um, the Interfaith Advocacy Conference about the importance of um, tweeting at or to uh, your mm -hmm. uh, members of Congress. And so once once you find the faith leader statement um, or other resources, uh, go ahead and just share that with them and let them know that those are priorities for you and, and people of faith in your community as well. Um, so anything else uh, I'm forgetting to ask you today, anything else you think it's important for Texans of Faith to know? Um, so I think it's, uh, I think, you know, we've reached a point where we do have to start thinking, um, how do we want to come out out of like coronavirus as a nation? And what is like that country that we want to live in after this crisis? I think this crisis have like touched many, many like different like aspects of, of our common life and has made us like think about the society that we will be living in. And, you know, I think this is like a good opportunity. Probably here I'm going to be pushing like my, <laughs> my strings a little bit. But when it comes to uh, immigrants, I think this, like, this proves that there's like an excellent point for us to actually work on an immigration reform that, uh, that actually recognizes all immigrants here in, in this country. I think it's, it's kind of like paving that path towards that um, it's not uh, just it is not fair that right now we're not including them even though they are 
parts of our society and they're contributing to help us. You know, I mean, I get my food from the farmer who is still working at the farm and because of him, I get to stay home. And the same goes from like the basic to the delivery people who, you know, every week here delivers like food to my house because like we have to, you know, we take a break and we're lucky to have, you know, to have that possibility. So um, I think this is like, a good point right now for uh, for our legislation to acknowledge uh, that you know most likely the U.S. economy is going to enter into a recession, and we have to incorporate those who like our immigrants into our strategy for an economic recovery. That you know is going to make a lot of sense, like um, fiscally speaking, than spending like tons of tons of billions of dollars and you know and still building like a wall or trying to keep them out by drafting uh like harsh policies towards them yeah um well that that was an important word and something that we'll have to be talking about for you know the next year or so at least i guess uh, anything else you'd like to shamelessly plug today i know we've been sharing a lot of the ELCA advocacy resources. You all are coming out with some some great stuff over the course of the last few weeks, and we certainly appreciate our, our partners in DC. But anything you'd like to shamelessly plug today? Um, shame. Well, I think like what I said before was <laughs> shame. I just like throw it out there. That's, you right. know, like I jump. Like I, you know, this is like a moment for us to uh, really think on like the big picture. And you know, I just want to like last. I want to just say like. You know, we were asked to stay home as much as possible. And, you know, the profound economic uh, impact of these measures are going to be especially harsh for undocumented immigrants and for farm workers and all of those. And many of whom, you know, work in the service industry, such as like restaurants and hotels and also in, like, in our informal economy. And... Many immigrants are not going to have income and they're going to be excluded from the social safety net that we're seeing un under the CARES Act. Um, and, you know, just to provide like a number, you know, extreme poverty is going to will extend to the more than the 5 million U.S. born children who have undocumented immigrant parents. And the one trillion economic relief package, which includes like pay leave benefits and direct cash for Americans, is not going to reach right now undocumented immigrants or their families. So this is why it's important that we raise our voice uh, right now with the with the Fourth Cares uh, Act. We have the possibility to you know to to make us be heard, um, and also like remind them you know this is you know we're at portals of like an, a really important like presidential campaign. Uh, coming and you know we have to be heard we have to be heard about like you know who do we care and what's the country that we want to live in and and like i said before viruses do not discriminate so you know we should all be like seriously in this one like together um so that's that's my last uh word on this yeah i think i think that's important our voice does need to be heard uh there are marginalized communities uh that are being hurt in, in, in cr just um, incredible ways. Uh, the racial disparities on the way this is hitting our communities are enormous. And so uh, we as people of faith have to be speaking up uh, about these issues. And, and I honestly think Congress is listening right now because they don't know mm -hmm. how to deal with this. And so we have a real opportunity to help shape the dialogue. Uh, and so it's, it's vitally important that faith leaders, the people of faith throughout Texas, throughout the country, um, get involved, make these telephone calls and, and let Congress know uh, what we're seeing and how they can respond. Um, they're mm -hmm. listening. So let's make our voice heard. Uh, Trini, thank you so much for the time. I uh, appreciate uh, the work, the ministry you're doing each and every day and for the prophetic voice that you have on, on this issue. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me, Scott. Um, I really welcome this opportunity. Yeah, so we'll look, we'll, uh, I'm sure we'll be hearing from you again and continue to share uh, the information you're passing down with, with Texans who need to get involved. Um, so thank, thank you all for tuning in. Uh, it is an important time, and, and we hope you are uh, taking this, these resources, sharing it with your congregations, and getting involved. Uh, remember that Texas Impact and the Weekly Witness community are still up and running. Uh, if you are 
If you appreciate the content you're receiving, make sure that you join, that you and your congregation are members of Texas Impact. You can do that at texasimpact.org slash join. Friends, I'll close out by saying that these are anxious times, but the world needs the community of faith uh, to be involved and engaged. So let's get to work.